other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Listen, they're all around you, close as a thought or a memory. Messages of hope. Messages of hope. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. My guest today is now a friend. I met her through my work as a medium. She has a story that might be difficult for some of you to hear. It is truly a tragic story, but it is a story of resiliency, a story of hope, and a story of finding out that this life is not all there is, which is exactly why she's on the air with me, because that's our main message, and it's the main message of hope, that love never dies, and life can be so hard at times, but with the knowing that our loved ones are still with us, it makes all the difference in the world. I'm wearing yellow on purpose today and a little flowery <laughs> necklace because we're talking with the author of a new book, Where Yellow Flowers Bloom, a true story of hope through unimaginable loss. The author is Kim Canton. So let me just bring her on the air right now. Hi, Kim. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. So good to see you again. Yeah. We first met when you contacted me about doing a reading for you. And I did that and we'll talk about it. But then I was so stunned when I went to San Diego and you were sitting in the front row. And at first I didn't know who you were because our phone, our reading was a phone reading and we didn't get to see each other. I believe if I recall mm -hmm. correctly. Yep. That tells you how long ago it was. Yeah. It was 2018. Mm -hmm. 2018 before Zoom. And I remember feeling awkward because your story was so painful. And I just, oh, so we're going to dive into it. But I want everybody to know that that it has a resolution. So mm -hmm. stick with us. Many of my guests are what we call shining light parents. They have a child across the veil. Many of my guests are someone who has a spouse across the veil. Kim has both. She's a shining light parent and the wife, a, a widow. She's basically a mm -hmm. widow. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it happened all on the same day. Mm -hmm. So why don't you just tell us what led to your family's tragedy? Sure. So there was, um, in December of 2017, there started what was then called the um, largest wildfire in California history. It was in, started in Ventura. It was called the Thomas Fire. And it was roaring um, with the winds toward Santa Barbara and Montecito where, where we lived. And um, there were three evacuations during that time. There was uh, on our phone, we'd get an app. It almost sounded like an Amber Alert and it would shrill out and it would tell us if we had to evacuate. And because the winds were blowing so heavily, and it, I believe it was burning an acre a second, like it was, it was unbelievable. Um, wow. We about, we about, yeah, yeah. Second. It was That's just it was, it, it's explosion. It was because there was just dry, dry foliage that hadn't been, you know, taken care of, and so it was just combustion. And so we never thought it would get to Montecito, um, but we had, we evacuated three times and I went about 40 miles South to my girlfriend's house from college. And when we got back, it was right before Christmas. It was, I think December 22nd. And who and it was she? Uh, my family. So it was um, on the last evacuation, Dave, my husband traveled a lot for business and he was in town. So it was the whole family, my husband, 49 year old husband, Dave, my 17 year old um, son, Jack, my 14 year old daughter, Lauren, and the um, big goofy Irish setter dog, Chester. And um, when we came back into Santa Barbara, it was really surreal looking because it was, it almost looked like it snowed. There was so much ash. The mailboxes were taped off. So there were no deliveries. They'd had the national guard there blocking people into the area. And it was the holiday that didn't happen, right? Packages weren't delivered, but it was okay. We were together. We were back our house. We thought it was saved. It didn't burn down. And we were starting to do all the cleaning of all the ash stuff, getting the rugs to the cleaners, you know, cleaning up the cabinets because it was all over. And um, so it was a great Christmas, very connected, just us. We had a great uh, New Year's with the kids, brought their friends over. And then there was forecast forecasted some heavy rain um, that first week of January. And I looked at the, the houses that sat precariously up in the hills of Santa Barbara, 
that now didn't have, because the fire came so close, now it had no foliagery. But massive boulders the size of cars would sit precariously on that hillside and you'd see the houses near them. And I remember thinking, I feel so bad for those people in those houses. I didn't feel bad for me because my house was in the village down below. So I didn't think that there would be a problem. And we watched the news and we watched our aware and beware. Do we need to evacuate? And in the heavy rains, we are not in the mandatory evacuation, um, but we had, you know, cleaned out our water drains. We had sandbags up. Um, I even had an, uh, uh, a hotel um, reserve. So if it rained heavy, we could just get out fast. And so um, we went to bed on um, January 8th and we thought the house was prepped. We knew we had a hotel room if we needed it. And we woke up in the middle of the night, probably around three in the morning to heavy rain. My husband and I got out. He went quickly to check on the house and we told the kids to get up and get dressed for getting out. And um, my husband said, hey, we're taking on water in the, in the detached garage. And I'm like, whoa. And then when I was in the house, I quickly changed. I look out the window and um, it went from pitch black dark to an eerie, almost nuclear bomb like yellow. And what had happened, there was a massive gas leak fire somewhere in Montecito that lit up the whole sky. Oh wow! And I said, Dave, something really wrong is going on. And he went out to check at the front door. The kids were getting dressed. I was, you know, in the living room dressed and he opened the front door. I saw him open the front door and he slammed it right away. And he goes back door now. And he flew out the back past me and he goes, Kim, get out, get out, get out. And I was trying to grab the leash for the dog. And what I think he saw, which my neighbors told me about who observed it. I think when he opened that door, he saw a 30 foot wave. Um, when it came down the creek, which was across the lane from us in a couple houses, boulders jammed up the underpass. And so as the creek curved, it plumed up to a 30-foot wave filled with car-sized boulders and down trees. If I could just interrupt, I remember watching videos after I heard the story personally through you of the Montecito mudslide. And you say there was a wave and people might think, oh, an ocean wave, like a tidal wave. No, it'd be, I've never seen anything like it. This wall of mud. Yes. But, but moving at the speed of water downhill, carrying cars and boulders just at rapid speed. You probably know this. They're at 30, 30 to 35 miles an hour. 35 miles an hour, a wall of mud. And that's what your husband saw coming towards the house. His, with his family in it. And so he saw that. I think I didn't. I was just trying to get to the back door, but my hand got stuck in the door. Um, it was a glass door. He was on the other side of it and I was on the inside. And he goes, get out, get out, get out. And I said, I can't, my hand's stuck. But I think that door saved my life. Um, I watched, he washed away. And um, when the Amber Alert first went off, not the Amber Alert, but the Aware and Beware Alert went off my phone, um, the mud was at my waist. And um, it was like uh, a jacuzzi. And so I, I said, I'm going under. I couldn't stand up. So I went under. Um, you know, all the details are uh, laid out um, in the book, but I went under. And then I think I, I went, lost consciousness. And I, went um, two football fields dis distance um, from my house and I was found in an intersection on a debris pile wrapped in electrical wires, severely injured. And my- Your, your entire house was just swept gone. away and, and demolished into pieces. It's not like Everything. the whole house moved, it just- There was no rebar left in the pool. It took everything out, gone, spread out. All, everything we owned spread over I mean, talking about airing your dirty laundry, <laughs> you know, it was all, all out there for everything, you know. It's, it's probably a blessing that you were immediately unconscious. Yes, it was. Do you remember having a thought, this is it? I remember, um, yeah, I remember going, oh God, I'm going to die tonight. And, um, and then I said, you know, I'm Christian, so I said, Jesus, save me, Jesus, save me. And, um, then I went under the mud and I was conscious under the mud, but I was being hit by granite and furniture and everything, you know, uh, oak planks that were coming up with nails in them. And I remember, cause I heard if you see the white light, you don't feel pain, like you're gonna get out of pain. So I opened my eyes under the mud, which I shouldn't have done cause I scratched all my cornea. And I go, if you want me to die tonight, I'll die. Just show me the white light. Cause I knew if I saw the white light, I wouldn't be in pain anymore. 
That's interesting because the white light is not objective. You would see it. <laughs> awareness. Yeah. I didn't know at the time. I didn't know. I just like, I want out of this pain and um, I wanted out of the pain. It was, it was um, excruciating. And, um, and then I think I must've gotten knocked out. And then I woke up and I was kind of dazed and I'm like, am I in heaven? Um, and then I started, I could touch with this hand. I kind of feel my body, what was going on. And I had a big, um, I don't know if you see it, but um, I had a big gash that was fleshy and I packed it back in. But when I packed it in, I packed it in with mud. And so they had to, you know, it's got flesh taken out of it now. Um, but yeah, it was pretty, pretty horrifying. And then my daughter, my 14 year old daughter was, she washed away one football field away and was buried alive under 20 feet of mud, um, two cars, an electrical transformer. Um, and a toolbox and part of a roof for um, six hours before her miraculous rescue. And, and it was anybody. What's the fastest way to find that on YouTube after this interview? After Type this? up her name, Lauren Canton, and you'll just see her rescue. And yeah, it's just it, it, it was shown around iconic. the world. It was shown everywhere yeah. on the news as the firemen pulled this mud covered young girl, 14 years old. Yeah. Out after six hours, you said six hours. She was dazed, but she insisted on walking, didn't she? Yeah, she, they said, can we carry you to the ambulance? She goes, I'll walk. She's the strongest girl I know. Yeah. Wow. So you were reunited at the hospital? Uh, she was in a different hospital than me. Um, right. uh, she was in, and um, so we talked on the phone, and then we FaceTimed, and then the next day she came over. I had surgeries the, the first night. So... so we don't want to belabor the, the challenging parts too much, but it is such an amazing story. Uh, you held hope that your husband and your son and your dog would be found. How long was it before you found out? They found Dave, your husband, pretty quickly. Yeah, didn't and they? they found Chester. Mm -hmm. So they did a dry run with me, um, which they told me later, of who was going to be in the room when tough news came. So there's a couple friends that were there. The priest was there. Um, my parents were coming into town. And... They told me the first day that they found Chester, my 90 pound Irish setter, and he was six foot up a tree crushed um, right by Lauren. And um, they wanted to see, you know, who needed to be in the room. And then the next morning um, after my surgeries, I believe, um, someone from the sheriff came and he said, we found Dave. And I said, alive? And he said, no. Um, and I said, are you sure? And he goes, we're really sure. And he was found, uh, he went a mile and a half. Um, but he wasn't in the house. There was nothing to slow him down from this fast moving, became a river. So, so it became clear the, the longer you waited that your son, Jack was probably not, had probably not survived, but yeah. I can't imagine the thought of you, your daughter was a football field away, a hundred yards from yeah. the house yeah. where it once stood you were two footballs away and your husband was a mile away. So how do you even begin to find your son's remains? Yes. When, every, how deep was the mud everywhere? What, describe the landscape. Oh my gosh. Well, if you look at the tree lines, they were up to 18 feet of mud and then it drained down to the ocean, right? Um, they, I heard a statistic, they took 50,000 truckloads of mud away. Mm. Um, it was 30 square miles of mud. And so our challenge was that exactly, Suzanne, of where do we look? We knew the logical, right, look from where the house was down and to the side because there was eddies that formed like jacuzzis. Um, and, and then we'd look to see where we found our stuff. If we found Dave's, you know, pair of shorts or we found um, my um, sterling silver um, spoon that was from my, my chest that I kept them in, um, we would find, I found some of my work stuff, my work presentation. And so we kind of got a radius of where Canton stuff was. Um, and that helped us. But I, what was interesting is I always kept being drawn in a certain area with my car and walking to a certain area. I was just drawn. Intuitive. And, yeah. Intuitively. I go, I just kept go in there and, you know, things were found there that were pretty um, impressive or astonishing, you know. 
but I know a little bit of a lip twitch there. I know you were you were guided by your son and your husband. Yeah. You, you turned to mediums to help you find Jack and to find mm -hmm. out about Dave. And um, I probably wasn't the first one, but had you. You were. Oh, I was? You were. My, I was in the hospital, severely injured, and my friend Marsha was trying to, um, she had been reaching out because she wanted to schedule a reading with you to learn about her mother. And she then after that emailed you and said, my friend it had this horrible situation. Can you get her ahead of me? And then um, you got me on the list. So it was from my friend, Marsha. You were the first. Uh, I um, remember, I think you, I knew some, I knew from your friend's email, I knew, I knew details that it, that yeah. you were, you're, you're, they found your husband. You didn't know where your right. son, son was. was. And I don't know. Do you know how long after the mudslide it was? Well, you did it three months after the mudslide because I had to be out of the hospital because I had to learn to walk again. Um, and so it was about three months after that you did the reading, but Marsha called from the hospital to help me. Okay. I, I always, uh, not always, I try to get people to wait about three months so the fog of grief lifts and to give those across the veil a chance to learn how to communicate and yeah, yeah, get, get settled. adjusted across the veil. So we that's right. We did it three months. And I recall connecting with both of them. I don't like missing persons cases. There's some really famous mediums who've been wrong, mm -hmm. either saying somebody's dead when they're not dead or mm -hmm. they're not dead mm -hmm. and they are dead. Uh, mm. But it was pretty clear after three months that he, he had passed in the mudslide. Me too. But I knew you were looking for answers, like where are we going to find him? So do you recall how the reading went? It was really, really helpful. It was, um, I was so, my focus was so much on where's Jack, where's Jack. So when you first started, you described someone with a blazer on and a patch. And I'm thinking, well, Jack went to a hippie school. But I'm like, oh no, you're talking about Dave. Dave went to a pre his prep school. He was a day student in Rhode Island and loved that high school. Mm -hmm. And so Dave came in first. And um, I think what was so healing is um, I think Dave said something like, we went up together. I scooped him up. We didn't feel a thing. Um, and that, I mean, the number one thing I think for me, um, I, I was talking to a traumatic um, sudden death grief expert. She helps people uh, as, a, as a psychologist. And she said, um, my work with you and others has been so significant in my healing because I've learned mediums. You mean? Yes. Yeah. So that I realize that we're more than our physical bodies and that Dave and Jack are alive and well in pure joy. And that has helped me from this unimaginable loss where, you know, it's easy just to sit in the fetal position, right. And not want to go out. Yep. And I'm not, that person anymore because I'm, I've learned, I've learned and I've seen so many astonishing signs that my son and my husband are alive and well. we'll we will get into those because everybody who listens to or watches this show loves the signs. We all do. I love them. Yeah. Love them. But um, I just want to tell those who might be new to mediumship that to, for me to deliver a message from, from your husband that I, I, that Jack and I went went up together, I scooped him up. That sounds like something anybody could make up, but a, an evidential medium, medium, like I am and many others, will get evidence that we couldn't know to say, this is, these are your loved ones. I'm, I've described their personality, I'm sure. And you did. Yeah. And the Jack, and, and, and you described Dave perfectly. My head was thinking about my son. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Yeah. But you described Dave to the T. Yeah. And, and, and then when they get messages like, we're okay, we're fine, we're yeah. together. And I know he said that we're together and you're with Lauren. So you're going to be okay. And we're still a family. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's what he said. He said, we're, I've got Jack, you've got Lauren and you're, and you're still a family. And that um, was such helpful framing for me. It gave me purpose with Lauren, right? I've got to, I'm, I'm, I have to stabilize for her. And I had the comfort of knowing Jack's with his dad. Yeah. But meanwhile, you became a woman on a mission. Huge People were determined to find just one, any piece of Jack, literally a piece of Jack. I know that sounds hard to say, but you needed some kind of remains. Something. You wanted something to, to bury. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I knew all along, you reached out to me numerous times looking for clues. We're on a dig or. Yeah. Anybody what else? do you think about this? <laughs> what do you think about this? How does this feel? Asked Dave. He woke me up. Uh, Jack woke me up one morning. I remember I was on vacation in Hawaii. He woke me up and he had something to say about rocks or something. And mm -hmm. I remember contacting you. You, yeah, you talked about, yes, it was, there was a cluster of five rocks. It would almost be like, what's that thing? There, there's a word. A Karen. A Karen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And that was significant to where you were looking. But I remember, in all honesty, thinking that mediumship shows her that the, he's not in the body and, and he's he doesn't need the body. But and so your search was for you, not for him, but it was for that. It's a human need for closure. And I, I couldn't say to you, give up. You know, you don't need it. I, I know I didn't because you know, you needed that. And you kept going for years. Yeah. years. And I remember the, the most exciting thing for me was when you asked people to get involved and we reached out to some, some members of a Facebook group yep. practicing mm -hmm. mediumship. And we said, everybody, we want you all to see if you can tune into Jack. Remember that? Yep. And that was helpful. I used that when we went out to search and my sacred search team, um, you know, we would go look in those areas, like we would, that would guide us. And so it was so helpful in my healing to hear that they're okay and well, but it was also important in the search because you helped get us really close to where, where um, we have ultimately found some of his remains. We ultimately did. And these searches are not just a bunch of people crawling around on the surface. You had back hose and dogs. You would tell us about the beautiful oh, efforts of your community to help. Oh, it was, um, I think, a silver lining to, to be witness to the compassion. We had some general contractors. Um, one was a woman, so I wasn't as used to seeing a woman coming off her, her caterpillar. And she would come and bring it, and we would take down piles. And then another woman, Sherry, um, who you met, she uh, lost her house, um, and she rode a mattress with her two young boys and said, hold on as tight as you can. And they rode the mattress to the roof of another house as her house washed away. And she would spot. So when, when Ann was scooping up with her earth mover, Sherry would look, what's there? Let's make sure there's nothing there. Um, are there any artifacts there? So we had um, folks, we had the, um, there was 2,000 dog hours of search and rescue dogs, of regular dogs that, that can find flesh. Then they even, um, we got the university involved and they um, got the canine historical dogs. And these dogs just went to look for Amelia Earhart in the South Pacific because they do older, right, bones and looking for Thomas Jefferson's brother in Monticello. And so they brought these canine dogs and those six out of six dogs hit of those canine forensic. And, and the stats are, if one dog hits, it means there's 30% chance of um, human remains. If there's two dogs hit, 60%. If three dogs hit, 90%. Six dogs hit in this one area. What and do they do? They sit down or they bark or what? They each have different, their, their trainer gives them a different command. Most of I see is laying down. Hmm. Uh, but they each, they're trained by their specific handler of what their um, alert is. Um, so it was pretty astounding. And then we brought in ground penetrating radar. Um, the university had an archeologist and she, she ran the, um, forensic lab and she, she, uh, was doing soil samples and curing and they, they actually buried some, um, parts of pig, um, to see, cause pig decomposes similar to human and they want to see what the soil changes are like and compare that with samples of soil to see if there's something that's similar where baby because we're looking for baby Lydia too, a two-year-old who was missing, or Jack. And so we deployed, uh, you know, I, I was looking for any resource um, to, to find our needle in the haystack. And the spot where the six dogs alerted and all in the same spot, how you actually did find something there? You know, there's a little log that you think you saw Jack on. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. 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 It was right. there? It's right around there. It's like so, probably four feet from there. So let's talk about that because it was one of the most stunning moments for me in my whole mediumship journey. You called me one day and said, we're at a site. Do you sense anything? Can you tune in to Jack? And so just right there, you know, you just shift. And I said, he's showing me a bird, a big bird, a crow. He's showing me a crow. 
and you took a picture, you looked down, what did you see? It was it was a dead bird, a crow on the ground, feathers, the lid and the, the wing, the wing, it was part of the carcass. It was right there. Right there. And you took a picture. I, and then he showed me, he he said, clear as day, X marks the spot. And, and there was an X on a tree. An X literally painted with on, spray paint mm -hmm. on a log on the ground. And you took a picture of that. And he described a creek nearby and a bank. So he was with you there in spirit yeah. as you're searching. So frustrating, though. I'm teaching a class in mediumship. And I said, you know, no medium is ever always 100% accurate. 90% is outstanding. We get 90% and higher. That's wonderful. And somebody said, well, why can't you be 100% accurate? Well, if we were, we would have been able to say, go here, dig there. It's just because we're talking to diff two, two different realities here. To get X marks to stop, spot and a crow and the other beautiful things that other mediums told you, it's like a miracle, really. So Ty and I were on our annual tour around the country, the Messages of Hope tour. I don't remember what year it was. And we said, how about we come and I'll walk the ground. Yeah. And we came in our RV. We were going mm -hmm. through California. And I remember meeting you in person. Mm -hmm. And this was like at least a year later. Yeah, um, it was 2019. 2019. And the devastation was still stunning and these big boulders and to go up and see just how the landscape had changed. I'd never been there before, but mm -hmm. to be there was stunning. I couldn't imagine at the time what it must be to, to, yeah. to have seen the before, to live there. And because all I saw was the after, but you took me to the spot where, where that X mark, the spot and the crow were. And for the first time ever, the only other person I've seen this with is my friend Brenda in spirit. I saw Jack in that moment. He was spread out on the tree trunk mm -hmm. like this, just kind of yeah. just hanging out. And he's smiling and he waved and he pointed right here. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. And in that same area, interesting, with the, with the six dogs alerted right by that area within probably four feet. Then they found a king snake. The professor was there and she goes, king snakes or snakes represent death. So she thought it was a sign finding this. And king snakes are, are friendly. They're good. They, they take care of the rattlesnakes. Mm -hmm. And so they carefully got this nice, beautiful five foot long king snake and, and removed it. But she's like, isn't that fascinating? So what was ultimately found there? Anything belonging? No, we well we found um, the Christmas ornament where um, that it was a, a Lennox porcelain um, train ornament that had my husband's name on it, um, and it didn't have a scratch. It went four hundred yards without a scratch. It was just dirty, and I think that was a jolt of keep going. I just remember the enormity of the task when I saw that whole area and said, "Talk about needle in a haystack." Total needle in the haystack, and. So we don't need to get into details, but you know, there really could have been some remains there that you just never found 18 feet of mud and dirt. So let's just jump ahead to the great news. I remember getting a text from you. I was excited to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, why don't you share? Yeah. So the university team got involved. They had been involved for about 18 months um, and they were out doing some digs and some students were there helping and they were going to do this one triangle area um, because they were going to um, the public works were going to do some work there but then the public work people were just planning that day not working and like oh my goodness I've got all these you know anthropology students coming to help and the professor and they're ready to work one guy drove 90 minutes from LA and and, and what university is it uh, University of California Santa Barbara okay Mm -hmm. It's a top 10 in anthropology. It's, it's a top research um, institution. And so I said, could you just go over there? Right. And so they went to a place we weren't expecting. And um, I decided not to be there that day. Um, someone had said to me, maybe Jack doesn't want you to be there when he's found. And so um, I was home. I was cooking dinner for Lauren and um, opening a can of chickpeas. And the professor texts me and she goes, hey, do you have a sec? I want to update you on today's effort. Okay. So I called and she's like, um, very quickly, she's like, we found bone. And I'm like, wow, wow. And I'm like, and this is how long after the mudslide? 
three years, three and a half years. Three and a half years. It was May, years. May of May of 2021, and it happened January. The mudslide was January of 2018. And you never stopped looking or no. hoping. Yeah. No, three. I knew. I, my mama's intuition was I knew he didn't go to the ocean. He was either hauled away, which some of them could have been, but the the messages were you mean hauled away in these truckloads of sure mud. sure sure that sure. must have been heart wrenching. But anyway, heart -wrenching. so you get this call though that they found uh, some bone. Yeah, and did you just know that was him? Yeah, I'm like wow. And then we, you know, I, I, you know, we had to follow protocol. I call, I cell phone the sheriff, like, hey, what's protocol and all that stuff. So then we followed that route, but it was um, it was remarkable. And then they kept looking and found more. And uh, it was just a it was just a debris pile that was there, and we'd kind of overlooked it a lot. It was kind of, maybe it was kind of too much in our face that we overlooked it, and um, and it was just fortuitous. It was just I'm so glad the public works people weren't working on that triangle medium that day. It got us there, and I had a team there, and they were using their fine you know tiny brushes, you know, because it was meticulous work, and they found small pieces. Right, we were first looking for a six foot tall male, and we then through the whole process realized he probably wasn't in one piece because it was such a traumatic event with the boulders and, and broken glass and electric electrical wires. So. When I visited you and Ty and I visited, you beautifully hosted us to dinner at your new house mm -hmm. and we got to meet Lauren Yeah, and your two dogs that mm -hmm. you have. And you showed us a lightsaber from Star Wars mm -hmm. that act was actually from, is that what it's called? Saber light, lightsaber? What it's a called? lightsaber, yeah. Yeah, George It was Lucas. actually in the movie, George Lucas gave it to you. He sent me two. One is for, for to bury with Jack and one was for me. It was the kindest thing he could have done. I remember that. And I don't think I ever got to ask you, did you then, once you found the bone, bury that lightsaber with Jack? Mm-hmm. And I bet he's giddy about it. No doubt. That, yeah. That, yeah. What was the significance there with Star Wars? He loved Star Wars. That was his thing. He just loved it. Even at when for his 17th birthday in November of 2017, so, you know, 45 days before his death, what he wanted for his birthday, he bought himself a $300 lightsaber, and he'd be dueling out with his buddy, another 17-year-old, or Dave would pick up one, and they just have, he just loved it. And so um, I had mentioned to when I was in the hospital and we were, thought we were be planning for some funerals, I told, I asked um, Jack's friend, Ellie, can you just go pick him up a nice lightsaber? You know, kind of like the $300 one, just so I'll have it for the casket. Well, she wrote George Lucas and he lives near us. Um, and he wrote me a handwritten note and he said, may the force, I'm so sorry. And may the force be with, be with him. Um, and I was just so touched by that. Uh -huh. Wow. So let's talk about your grieving process. It, uh, it's hard enough to have your husband immediately you have to start grieving him. And then, then there's that state of suspension while yeah. trying to find your son, even though you know he's gone and mediums are talking to him. Yeah. It was the search, did that keep you going? Did you put your grief on hold? Did the, well, you already talked that the, the mediumship helped you because that in that way yeah right. i think with the sudden sudden traumatic death you know um i didn't have anticipatory grief like someone who's uh, got a spouse dying of cancer right it was just all of a sudden the next morning they're not there and so uh, and i was in shock and injured and we were doing the search and i had to stabilize for lauren so my grief i think was really delayed um i did work on my grief with dave i went to widow's group so i had focus time when lauren was at school um, I went to the, the survivors of the mudslide. We had a group meeting um, that was helpful. So I did a lot of stuff, um, but clearly um, five years, I was, it was, it was a long process. Um, it was a long, long process um, to get through it because I had to heal, stabilize Lauren. I was out on the search and poor Dave didn't get as much attention as he needed for him or me. <laughs> And so that took longer. It wasn't, you know, some people can get through grief in a year, maybe, you know, I mean, it gets lighter, not saying they're over it, but lighter. Yeah. And mine took longer. So your book where yellow flowers bloom is, is really the story of your journey. You, woof, yeah. 
the details that came out in here about the actual mudslide were stunning. If you, you, you're beautiful writer, I remember reaching out and saying, I know. did you write this? <laughs> did you write this? It's, it's so beautifully written. I thought you Thank had you. a professional Thank writer. You. Well, you are a professional author. Let me tell you, it is Thank you. beautifully written. And it was a passion project, right? I, as I started yeah. reading it, I realized it was, it was healing me and I thought it might heal others. No doubt about that. Even though it's hard to read, others can identify and say, if you got through this okay, and you didn't curl up in a ball forever, right? you had Lauren to keep you going. By the way, Lauren is, has an, she's in college now. Yeah. And she has an amazing singing voice and was honored by singing the national anthem at the start of what game? Um, she did it at two. She did it at the um, Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati, um, Chicago, um, the Cubs versus um, the Cincinnati Reds. And then she did it for the LA Dodgers. Um, and she was on the, and Laura uh, uh, DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She sang, she sang, she sang yeah. on there. And I was so pleased when I watched those videos years ago to see this wasn't just, oh, let's take this. 15 year old at the time or 14 year old girl and let her sing in public because she was traumatized. No, it's listen to this and this angelic voice, listen to this beautiful singer. So you said it she was healing. It was, I mean, like when she did it in the community, there was a big fundraiser called the um, eight of uh, kick, kick ash bash. And it was raising money for the first responders. And so a lot of people came, you know, Ellen was Ellen DeGeneres was there. Katy Perry sang, Kenny Loggins sang David Foster. And um, she sang with David Foster. She sang and it healed that when they saw her sing, Lauren feels her feet on the ground when she's singing and it moves people because they, they watched her come out of her entombment. And now she's singing to raise money for disaster relief and watching that, that she was healing by singing. It was just, it healed all of us, I think. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the signs then. With yeah. Signs from Jack and from Dave. If there are there specific ones that you know who's who or, or. The, you know what? I think there's birds. There's, there's um, out in my, um, in Santa Barbara, outside my window, there's um, in, in the little distance, there's um, uh, power, power lines. And there's two little birds that sit there and look into my master bedroom window. And I just know it's them. Um, and uh, so I think in, in birds, um, early on, they did a lot with electricity. My phone would just blast oh. uh, on, on my Mayo stand in the uh, hospital. Um, it would just go off. Wow. Um, in my new home that you were at, um, in the kitchen and there's, there's, um, there's this gal who's been staying with us and she's like, that is Jack and Dave. Like they're messing with that light all the time just to say that they're there. And when um, your phone would blast, did you ever know what it blasted? Did, were there any specific noise? It was a noise. Oh. It was a noise. Uh huh. Yeah. Huh. It was a noise. Um, that's unusual in itself, right? I, I, yeah. Don't, just don't do that. No, I just did it. And uh, yeah, so birds do it for me um, a lot. Um, even just I was at, I was on the treadmill the other day at the club. And um, I think it was like Dave's birthday. He just had a birthday. And there's this little bird that just sat down and he just looked at me for the longest time. And it was just, and, and you know what happened at the, at Dave's or Jack's memorial service at the mission, as everyone's in there and a eulogy is being spoken for Jack, two birds swoop into the Santa Barbara mission and, and one goes up to the windowsill to hang out and watch while the other one is prancing and dancing around saying, look at me, look at me. And the priest stopped and he goes, that's Jack. The priest? Dave, the priest said it, the Catholic okay. priest. He goes, I think Jack's here and there's Dave just watching him. That's in the book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. You, you, I just glanced down at the notes from when we were talking before the show started. You said that it found a Christmas ornament in that spot where were mm -hmm. the bird, but you said they also found his backpack there. Yes, his backpack and his glasses. Yeah. Which really, um, and he was wearing his backpack, right? I think what he was, he was getting ready to go, had his backpack on, he probably had his computer in his hand because he treasured his computer. He, he was a big gamer. And then I think he just got whacked. 
And so I think you probably traveled with that backpack on for a while. And that's exact area that you told us about. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you said that the, it took you years to write the book. And of course you needed closure first, the years to get to the point where you were ready to write it. Mm -hmm. What was the process of reliving all that like? Um, it was actually, well, I first started off, I wanted to get it down. So I didn't, I wanted to be able to tell my future family, if Lauren has kids and I have grandchildren, I wanted to get the facts from me, um, and tell the story. And then Lauren, Lauren in the book writes her story, you know, so you hear her firsthand account of being buried alive. Um, and, and as I did that, I'm like, it was just kind of cathartic. It's like, wow. And reflective, like, I can't believe that happened. It's still shock. Like, did that really happen that my house was obliterated with me in it with car sized boulders, but it did. And it did. And so I just kind of got through it and then, and then went through the search and just talked about just the astonishing things that happened, the gratefulness to the mediums who helped that, that, were instrumental. We would not have found, we would not have found Jack's remains without um, that help. We I have. didn't know that. We wow. wouldn't have. Well, one of, one of the, okay, here's one of the ladies and it was at the very end and, and I knew you and I knew Catherine, who I call Catherine the Catholic who lived in town, who helped in that. Catherine well. the Catholic and I was Navy Suzanne. Navy Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> we all have those nicknames for you. You did have nicknames because my sacred switch, I'm like, well, Navy Suzanne says this. And then Catherine, and they were just, it was so funny because Rick, who had the dog handler, at first he really didn't pay much attention to this stuff. And um, he just kind of smile and just like, let's get the dog to work. But then one day um, we'd gotten some clues from Maritza that um, I'm going to meet three workers that day, a Jeff, I think a Mike and a Ruben. Maritza, so, did she have a nickname? Um, I call her Mag magnanimous, magnanimous Maritza. But, okay. but earlier on, I called her murder Maritza, which she didn't like because she helped find buried murder victims. And she goes, but that's not a good name. So not a good just, name. it's no. not a good name. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so I hear that we're supposed to meet these three names, Jeff, Mike, and a Reuben at this, um, they're clearing out these pipes. And so Rick's there with his dog and the sacred search team. And I meet the guys and I went up to shake their hands and hi, I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Jeff. And I go, all we need is a Reuben. And Rick steps forward and he says, my Hebrew name is Reuben. And he went from a kind of, I don't understand this to cautious wonder. He was like, um, he, he, he couldn't believe it. And from that point forward, he couldn't believe it. Believe it, everybody. I think I got the goosebumps going down my legs now. This is yeah. so real, the greater reality. They want to help us. Your son, your husband yeah. were helping all they were, the They trying. even brought the mediums to you, no doubt. Yeah, well, and then the last one, the question was, um, so I was set with my mediums who were helping me, but then a friend called and said, you've got to talk to this this one gal. Um, and I'm like, I really don't need to talk to anyone, right? Like, and she goes, no, you really do. So I'm like, okay, she lived close by. I said, walk the area. And she goes, yellow will be very important to the find because we saw a clump of yellow flowers. She goes, yellow flowers will be very important. She didn't know why she just said yellow flowers. Okay. So go ahead and explain that now. And it's why the book is called where yellow flowers bloom. Yeah. So if you got to remember, um, 150, I think 100, uh, 400 homes were destroyed or damaged. And so as they're being destroyed and damaged, that is, um, all the stuff in their garage, the insulation, the um, insecticide, you know, all the, the hairsprays, all that stuff is, is, is um, getting in the soil. And that's what was left behind, like really toxic soup soil. It has arsenic in it. And the thinking is nothing should be able to grow in that. And where the bones were found was a pile that was graced with beautiful yellow wildflowers. And so my daughter helped come up with a name and it's really the metaphor for life where but they weren't just wildflowers are yellow, wildflowers. yellow wildflowers that were spectacular. And so one of the students who had found some of the bones clipped them that night and brought them in a vase to my house. And she said, um, life found a way. And I said, no, love found a way. Wow. Yeah. What a perfect title for your book. 
Yeah. I know. I know. I thank my daughter for that. Yeah. Well, you said that writing the book healed you. Yeah. And healing, <laughs> healing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Huh. So you also so told me you, you've kind of reached a turning point in your journey. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't under, I, I knew the book was helpful for me, but since the book has launched, I've really shifted into kind of my next phase of moving forward and feeling I, I'm so confident Dave and Jack are alive in full joy. Mm. I know it. I get the signs. I know it. And I know the best way I, I can honor my husband and my son is for my daughter and I to live a joyful, meaningful life. And that's what I want to do. That's it. Wow. What a painful, painful episode. Parentheses in your whole life, I hope. Yeah you've been through and now you're you're showing the way for others that about what resilience is all about how would mm -hmm. you define, define resilience oh gosh it's i think it's follow your intuition um of what you believe to be true and go after it and um and get all the resources you can and be open to all the resources right i had the the scientists at a top 10 research institution, right? A university. I had the canine search dogs. I had the regular search dogs. I had mediums, expert mediums, Suzanne, right? I had mediums. And, and student all mediums. of it. And student mediums who were very yes, helpful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And all of it combined helped our find. It wasn't any one, not one, one of those alone would not do it. It was, it was the combination of everything. I love that that helped us get to our needle in the haystack. And you never gave up hope. No, I knew he was out there. You were the mama bear. I was a mama bear. How do you honor Jack and Dave now? Um, well, they just had birthdays. So we do stuff for their, you know, obviously their, their, their birthday, you have their favorite meal and Dave liked lobster and, um, you know, it, it, it's what they, it, you know, Jack really liked his, his one Mexican restaurant in town. Um, we honor just by trying to, to live, um, a meaningful life. I mean, we've did things where, um, I wanted to do something that would be nice to honor Dave and he liked that high school, right. That you knew that he, you introduced him in his, in his little jacket with a patch and they wanted, you know, some kind of donation to honor him. But then a scout camp burned down uh, nearby, and oh, ten thousand big into scouts. Yeah, he was yeah. a scoutmaster, and he um, it was meaningful for him to help these these young people. Now both um, boys and girls can be in scouts, and um, this camp burned down. Ten thousand kids use it every year. Families use it. The scouts use it, and so instead of giving to this prep school, I um, thought, what would Dave want? And I. I donated money to redo the road to enter the camp so the camp could be opened and they're calling it Dave Canton way. Uh -oh. um, so I'm thrilled about that. And then um, with Jack, um, I, he went to a middle school that was um, pretty meaningful for him. And so, um, and he did his Eagle project um, to a school that's really underfunded and the kids there, a lot of them live under the poverty level. So I helped sponsor um, one of those students in Jack's name to, to be able to go to this um, really interesting independent school. And they're watching all of this from their viewpoint and saying, yeah, way to go. Beautiful. Yeah, I wanted to do something that was meaningful for them. Nice. Well, what would you say to anybody who's listening now that we didn't already cover? Um, whatever you're going through. Um, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> um, and um, find your tribe, the tribe that will help you and would help me with people. People were my anecdote. Suzanne, you were my anecdote. Um, Catherine the Catholic was my anecdote. Rick, um, Rick, my search dog handler with MacGyver, he lost his child um, who died in a car accident at 20. And he was out with me one day searching like he came out so many times and he said once to someone, he goes, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I go, how can you say that you lost your son? 
And he was the perfect tonic for me because I got to see that he moved forward mm. and he's living a life. And that's the best way he can honor his son, Brad. And, and um, it makes, if I could just make this point, we don't move forward without them. The right. mediumship shows they're still part of your life. So you can still have a life filled with love and you can love again. And they don't mind because each person we love uniquely yet fully, and they're still here and know yeah. from the higher viewpoint. That's why we're here to love. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, um, so I just hope if, if for those who maybe are going through a tough time, um, I've heard people who've read it saying, you know, it got them access to their grief. Um, it gave them a new way, kind of a, a shift in hope and how to look at life. Right. Cause I see how, you know, I, I was a poster kid of, you know, a bad thing happening, right. <laughs> House gone, husband dead, son's dead and missing, daughter's buried alive, I'm severely injured. Like I hit all the points of bad, 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 and bad. And, um, and, and I wanna go forth and, and um, you know, I, I think the sign of the best life is you give more than you get. And I wanna give more than I get. And that's of compassion, right? Love it's not that. of compassion and kindness. Hmm. Well, you're doing a great job of it in your book radiates that hmm. really you don't sugarcoat it yet you don't drum over dramatize it you found just the right tone and it's lovely yeah. wow Whew. there was something i wanted to ask you and now i've forgotten what it is hmm. oh i know what i wanted to comment on just that you, you i commented that you changed your hair color since i yes. last saw you mm -hmm. and you remember what you told me well, it gives, it's, it's easier to manage. Um, Jack had always wanted me to, to change the color, but it helps keep me um, more incognito with some of the media stuff because I was, we, the family, our Christmas card was front page of, of all the major newspapers. <laughs> and, um, and so being this color, which Jack always wanted me my natural color, this is my natural color, um, is it makes me more incognito that I'm just Kim. It, not, it allows you to be just Kim. Just Kim, not mudslide Kim. I don't want, I, and I told Lauren that in the hospital. I said, this will not define us. This will not define us. This, this happened. This is a part of our story, but this is not our story. That's right. I just did a reading this morning and a woman's mother came through and she said, don't let the way I died define my life. That was one little moment in all of these happy moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. What a good point to make. Yeah. Anything else before we... Well, if it, people want to get the book, it's on Amazon. Oh. Um, you know, they can easily get it on Amazon. And um, I think it's... I think we're here. Where yeah. yellow flowers bloom. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I think we're here to evolve. And I've evolved through this whole process. I'm much more spiritual. I'm much more, um, I think, empathetic. Um, and I'm really, really sure that we're more than our physical bodies. And that is a gift that I've learned. That's a gift. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I wish thank we, you. we hadn't had to meet because of the way I you know, met, but, uh, I, I love knowing you now and I know. I'm Likewise. glad that we can share you with everybody else in this way. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, We'll be back in a couple of weeks or so. Just go on my website to sign up to be notified in advance of these uh, episodes if you'd like to join us live. Otherwise, all the past episodes are available on uh, in the archives at mindbodyspirit.fm and on major podcast platforms. So thank you all so much. I'm so touched by Kim's story. I know you are as well. Sending lots of love to all of you.